Hello everyone, I'm Tony and tonight I'm presenting uh, parts of my uh, PhD study and also my postdoc research. Uh, I just titled that one Reading Minds, uh, but this is not something like you're thinking of, like you probably just go some people just claim some metaphysics like uh, things, but this is a completely scientific presentation. So uh, what the means of Reading Minds in my world? So, uh, all right. So we have uh, different subjects. Subject, I, I prevent to say patients because most of the people I'm working with, uh, there's brain activity, are healthy, uh, healthy people. And uh, we just gathered uh, these healthy people's neural activity while they're watching different visual stimuli. And we wanna use machine learning to reconstruct the actual image uh, based on their neural activity. So uh, during my presentation, I'm just showing you a pipeline how we can just predict there's uh, what they actually saw during the, like uh, capturing their neural activity based on the other people's like uh, neural activity and some machine learning approaches. So, uh, I'm going to talk first a little about the basis of the functional neuroimaging. Then I'm just talking about the machine learning approach, showing you some uh, reconstructed image based on our approach and other uh, existing approach and talking about some future works. So first, uh, let's start talking about the functional neuroimaging. Tonight, I'm just talking about the task-based fMRI analysis. I know we have different like modalities like EEG, MEG, but fMRI is the things we are working on right now. And we have tons of like uh, open access data set that uh, enable us like learn different like cognitive states. So this is fMRI machine. As you can just see here, one subject just laid and we can capture the neural activity. And during this like uh, capturing neural activity, we can, uh, the, the subject can watch different things. Here in my case, they are watching greater scale photos. And we would like to uh, gather this neural activity, which here I just uh, have an example of that one. And based on that one, we wanna just guess what exactly they watch and reconstruct the image. So uh, the procedure is simple. Uh, somehow uh, we have a subject, we, uh, we have fMRI machine, capture the neural activity, they are watching different photos and we can uh, get some area of like the brain which use more oxygen than the other. So fMRI will not trace the actual neurons. It just show us which region of the brain use more oxygen than the others. And based on these things, we have a tabular representation of the data. So these data come from the fMRI. And uh, I'm during my presentation, I have two like representations for this one. One is the tabular one, and another one is for geometric one. Why we have two representation of this uh, like neural activity? The reason is that one is more understandable for machine, and another one is for human being. So uh, here, this table is really like well designed for to like machine learning just uh, algorithms just learn from this table but here we have some concepts can be shown by like geometry so for instance here we have three different stimuli fa human face shoe and chair and we have three time points for each each of them and we also have different voxel values so voxels are equivalent of the pixel in 3d space so this is what fmri generate for us and we have different uh, numerical result and we can gather this one based on uh, and then label it based on what a stimuli uh, like watch during the uh, like the experience and again we have a neural activity for each of a stimuli we have tabular representation and we have the geometric representation in my world people just call this one representational space if we, you talk with some mathematician they just call this one vector space so they are actually the same things so so different area different like uh uh, abbreviation for uh, same concepts. So uh, up to now, we talk about a single subject brain. So uh, it's definitely not working. Like uh, if I'm just uh, decoding my own brain based on my br uh, own like neural activity is easy task. But uh, for uh, most of like cases, neuroscientists are looking for uh, like generalize the model for multi subjects. So that's the reason we can just uh, like repeat whole of the experience for multi subjects and then get like uh, neural responses for these subjects. But 
uh, before we just get into the machine learning uh, like uh, phase, we have a big issue. So my brain and yours are completely different because of the connectomy and the uh, gene expression of our brains. So that's the reason when we uh, like trace the usage of oxygen by using like fMRI machine, these like values will be located in different like uh, uh, spaces in like different location of like uh, that representational space. That's the reason uh, in 2011, uh, one uh, really famous like neuroscientist uh, just uh, suggest uh, like we fix this issue uh, by something called functional alignment. So functional alignment in general, so the experiments like this, uh, we have two subjects, they are watching the Indiana Jones movie and we trace the voxel, sorry, uh, the voxel value here. And uh, by uh, like connecting the, the different value of these voxels during the time. So these arrows just show the uh, change of these voxels across the time. So we can see that the patterns are actually the same but they have some rotation. So that's the reason for multi-subject study, we try to transfer like all of this neural activity to some common space, such that these like similar category of a stimuli will be located in like the same place. So we call this one functional alignment and like this is a major part of my PhD study and I published several papers how we can uh, align this neural activity. And another thing I have to like mention here, we don't have exactly the same faces for all people. We have group of faces, group of, for instance, here, scissors, but uh, these the concepts are the same, but the face itself and even the angle of the face is different uh, during the like capturing the fMRI data. So uh, just imagine we have this data and we, for multi-subject, we align them somehow uh, in this space. And right now we want to do the machine learning uh, algorithm for that one. Before I'm getting for like the, uh, how we reconstruct the real image, I want to also mention some classic like uh, approach in machine learning in general. And that one uh, is called like, uh, classification analysis. So just imagine in general, we have some data and we wanna like label this data. So here we have the same do, uh, like uh, neural activity and we wanna just see this is for phase, group of faces or group of like shoes and so on. So for this one, we first collect the other data from other people. So here in my world, like the test subject is completely independent than the, those subjects will be involved in the training phase. And we label this thing. So for these subjects, we have the actual label. So we know that, for instance, the, this neural activity is belong to watching face, shoe, and so on. And then we can train some algorithms, somehow just partition this representational space where we, uh, when we just look at this like uh, classifier, see that, all right, everything uh, located somehow in this real recycle, it should be like chair or it should be uh, shoe uh, if it's located in this uh, blue area and so on. And based on this algorithm, we can just evaluate our like training data and we can label them. And then we evaluate like how much this classifier works. So this is the basic idea, more major of like neuroscience, like the study is doing this one. And here we are not actually guess what was the face. So we are not actually saying that, all right, this is Tony face or this is Noah face, right? This is, we can just say that, all right, these should be faces. This should be like shoes. But what if we wanna just actually like reconstruct the image? So the theory is the same. But the point is that if you look at the, like the actual greatest scale photos, you can just see that they are including like the real photos, not the fMRI. They have pixels. And these pixels, when we have like, for instance, the greatest scale pictures, they have some values between zero, which is black and completely white 255. So if we train a bunch of this classifier for each pixel, then we probably can reconstruct the image. So here, instead of predicting this is a face or this is like a shoe, for each pixel we predict what is the value of this one given like that fMRI data. But the basic problem here is that if you have like uh, 10 by 20 like pixel, which is very really a small like actually like uh, picture, 
then you have 2000 prediction. And this is really hard to like predict something like this. And you need tons of data, but you know, you uh, most of like fMRI data set doesn't have like enough subject. Like they have like a bit something between 10 to 100 subjects. And uh, probably you have uh, around like 200 like time points per subject. So you don't have tons of like big data uh, to just predict something like this. That's the reason we used another idea to just improve the prediction rate for reconstructing the image. So the basic idea here uh, is uh, something called latent space. So we know that we have a lot of information in the neural activity and also the picture. But if you see all of these pictures, for instance, the background is always gray. So we always have some parts of the image which we don't like it. And you know, actually the brain uh, doesn't care about that one. So you probably, even you don't at, uh, pay attention to the background until I'm just saying, all right, see the background. So that's, the, uh, that's why we try to compress this uh, information and just get some more effective like uh, information here. And that's why we map them to something called Latin space, which is a zipped version of like information in data space. So we, uh, for the circles or fMRI, the triangles are like the actual image. And we try to just map this neural activity to the circle ones and the uh, real photo uh, to like this uh, triangle one. And our uh, brain decoding algorithm actually match these things to each other. So using some weighted things, uh, we have in our like uh, learning procedure, we try to match this thing. So for instance, we have three subjects here. The first two are well matched and this one is probably our like learning error. So this is the whole of the idea. So first we get really large scale of like photo things. And then we try to like, somehow zip them, compress them to get more effective feature space and then learn uh, to those feature space to match them. So the procedure here is done uh, by uh, our uh, TI GAN actually algorithm. We have real photos and we try to re resize these photos to compress them somehow to some Latin space. And then we reconstruct this image here. And we have some uh, another neural network here to uh, uh, check the quality of our reconstruction. So here we, uh, we are not talking about fMRI, we're just talking about the actual image. So we just compress them and then reconstruct the compression to see how much these features are affected. And where is the fMRI? It's here. We are doing the same thing here with another type of neural network. And if you know the deep neural network, this is called autoencoders and this is LSTM. These LSTMs are famous to understand the correlation between like images. The reason we are using this one is uh, brain images are highly correlated. So you have really little changes of like oxygen during each frame of like brain image. And here uh, we uh, like infuse like the information from the brain image uh, data here to make more effective Latin space to reconstruct these images. And then our model learned two things. One Latin space, which I just showed there by triangle here uh, in my previous slide. And uh, this is for the actual image and this neural network, which is that circle one in the previous slide, which is uh, the brain uh, like neural network, which can compress the neural activity. And in the testing stage, we have a new subject and that uh, we like pass through the uh, neural activity to generate some compressed version of the neural activity and then use this net uh, this network generate for us that compressed information and the, uh, this part like the decoder part of our real image can understand this like compressed information and reconstruct the images so uh, this is the whole of idea i don't want to just go through like the mass things uh, here in this presentation uh, but this is the uh, main idea Let's see some experiments to see uh, how our model works. So uh, in this experience, the first row is the actual image, the subject watched during the like, fMRI scan. These are our competitors, like different like uh, machine learning approaches. And the last one, TI GANs, is ours. And as you can see here, uh, you know, uh, for instance, this one is really noisy. This is something like average between like six and nine. 
And from here, there are like the major like uh, competitors. One of them also use the uh, GANs like network, but uh, don't use the temporal information like connected uh, like time, different time points to each other uh, using LSTM. And here you can just see that ours almost like uh, generate better like prediction in comparison with the rest of them. So I have another like a category of a stimuli, the same thing here happening. And here I have uh, all like data just uh, presented to uh, like 12 subjects during this experience. And this is the reconstruction of the faces and like uh, other like objects. So uh, uh, we also can see uh, how much uh, each part of our algorithm is effective. So uh, this is the original data and this is our final prediction. And this is when we don't use that LSTM to compress the brain neural activity. So you can see that that comparison can, uh, without that comparison, the data could be a little fuzzy. And the reason is that, you know, you capture whole of whole brain data and the most major part of that data is not related to the vision at all. So you probably have really noisy things because you just move your hands or leg during the scan. But that one is in the motor cortex that are not related to our, like, uh, stimuli or we have here also uh, another like uh, result without compressing the real image and you can see that you know uh, the brain data itself is more noisy than the like the, if, by like comparing like the uh, reconstruction you can see that this one has a worse result like uh, than like uh, without like image uh, uh, reconstruction and uh, sorry, image comparison. Uh, and here uh, we have uh, like by combining all of them, we have like the, our final result. So this is uh, the result. And let's talk about the future work. So uh, in nutshell, I just uh, introduce you like some basic uh, functional neuroimaging uh, uh, concepts, our machine learning uh, approach, and also experience. And these are related papers. Uh, all of these papers can be like uh, the, uh, accessible through my personal website. And uh, we also have a toolbox called EasyFMRI. And this is uh, end to end uh, toolbox for uh, brain decoding and neural activity uh, study. And uh, this is open source. Uh, we would love to like uh, welcome all people just uh, contribute to uh, this one. We need people to uh, develop the algorithms, the, write the documentation and so on. And this QR code, uh, you can just scan to just go like to like the uh, uh, website of our toolbox. And we also have another uh, simple library called EasyX. We uh, originally uh, like developed this one to save big complex data structure. So you can just uh, like dump 100 GB memory in the like single file and can load it very fast. This is one is originally like designed for uh, uh, saving like neural activity and fMRI data because they're uh, almost uh, huge. And, but it can be used also in different uh, machine learning applications and like other applications. So that's it. And I hope, you know, I just uh, present in 50 minutes.